Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to crime entertainment. I want to apologize off front. If I cough a little bit in this video, I'm seriously battling a cold, but we wanted to try to get this behind the serial killer out to you. We've been having a good run with these lately, Ignacio, um, yes, sir. Golden state killer, uh, Richard Ramirez, John Albert, Wayne Gacy, Albert Albert Fish. Fish. Yeah. 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 So we're covering old school today. We're going back in time a little bit. H H Holmes. What a character. Yeah. Allegedly, which I don't kind of believe, but that's what they say. America's first serial killer. But I, I think there was other ones, but this is the one that got caught right, <laughs> and executed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, again, like I said, if I cough for a little bit during this, please forgive me. I'm still getting over a cold, but we're going to try our best to get through this. And a lot of, I, I do want to say before we hop into this, it's hard to get a lot of facts on this in the case. That is true. Because everything was blown way out of proportion. Yes. There wasn't a whole lot of investigation done when this was going on. So it's, it's really difficult to get facts. So, you know, we try our best, you know, we go, obviously this happened a long, long time ago. So we're going off, you know, the best information we have. Um, but I do want to preface it that I, I can't say 100% that everything we're going to talk about is facts as far as the murders. Some people say he never killed anybody at all. You know, sometimes there's been counts of up in the hundreds of 200s of people. So it, it, it's all, all, all over. It's all over. Some say the murder castle was it. Some say it was a, a fiction from the yellow media at the time. Right. And also uh, there we'll get into it towards the end, but possibilities of him being an entirely different famous serial killer. Uh, we'll get into that too. Possibly. That's, that's something so, we, we can go either way on that one too. Herman Webster Mudgett, Mudgett. born May 16th, 1861. Died May 7th, 19, 1896, excuse me, uh, better known as Henry Howard Holmes or H.H. H. Holmes. So Henry Webster Mudgett was his, uh, I guess, original name there. I, I, uh, I can see why he wanted to change that. Yeah, a little bit. I <laughs> Mudgett, Midget, Mudgett yeah. the Midget. That's, he, yeah. he was not the tall guy either, so I, I can see that. <laughs> Um, American con artist, serial killer, active between 1891 and 1894. By the time of his execution in 1896, Holmes had engaged in a lengthy criminal career that included insurance fraud, forgery, swindling, three to four uh, illegal marriages, horse yeah. theft, and murder. Horse theft. That's actually kind of interesting, uh, which leads into him actually getting pinched for murder. That's uh, right. Pink the Pinkletons. Yeah. Yeah. His most notorious crimes took place around the Chicago area um, at the time of the World Columbian Exposition in 1893. That's kind of alluding to the house, the murder castle we were talking about. Yeah. Uh, despite his confession to 27 murders, including some of the people who were verifiably still alive at the time. So there you go. We're trying to beef up that number. Um, yeah. Holmes was convicted and sentenced to death for only one murder. And that would be his business partner and accomplice, uh, Benjamin Peitzel. Uh, it is believed he also killed three of Peitzel's children, which is kind of interesting. We'll get into that here. Yeah, horrible. And as yeah. well as, as well as three mistresses and the child of one mistress and the sister of another. Now, do you know how they killed him? Do you know how he was executed? Yeah. They hung him. Uh, when did, do you know right off him when hanging, like went out, like when they stopped doing that? They're still, they were still doing it, I, I think, in uh, in the 20th century. Really? Yeah. They, they, I think there's still maybe one or two places that may still have it, but I think a lot of people have gone to lethal. Most states have gone to lethal injection now. No more all sparky, that's for sure. Yeah. Not to get off topic here, but they just, I think Alabama just uh, put somebody to death with nitrogen. Nitrogen. Uh, I, nitrogen. I heard that. Yeah, yeah that, that, that was a big thing. I, I didn't know the Supreme Court was going to let it go forward because it, the, the appeals of the Supreme Court. And I'm going to get a little topic here, but yeah. uh, it went through. It went through. Let's yeah. see how this that, that this works out. So I don't but, know about. Hanging. I don't know. I mean, obviously that's a horrible choice, but I, I'm wondering if he chose hanging or if that was just what they gave him. I, I think that's what how it worked in in, uh, in Philly in Philadelphia. But I, what I heard is he didn't snap his neck right away. He was oh, strangled wow. to death. He, he he for 18 minutes. Horrible 18 death. minutes. He, well, suffered, he, he suffered extensive, but he was also a guy who made people suffer. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, normally I would say that's a little inhumane, but on this case, uh, you know, it yeah. is what it is. Um, yeah. Much of his lore is attached to 
Yes. The, what you talked about earlier, the murder castle, the three story building he commissioned in Chicago. Um, a little bit about that building along with this many, uh, other, his other alleged crimes are considered, like we said, exaggerated, fabricated, and, uh, you know, just blown up a little bit by the tabloids. Um, like said, with some of the people, you know, estimating his body count anywhere from 133 to even 200. I mean, it's like we said earlier, it's very hard to verify with the lack of yeah. investigation that was going on. Um, I think for sure we can say for sure, uh, Ben Pitzel, his daughters, his son, right, and a few other ones. Yeah. But I, I don't think even 27 will be the right number for this guy. Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the, the possibilities are, are definitely endless with what we'll get into we'll here. Yes. Uh, a little bit on his background. He was born Herman Webster Mudgett, as we said, um, in Gilmanton, New Hampshire, uh, the third child of Levi Horton Mudgett and Theodore Page Price, both of whom were descendants from the first English settlers in the area. Uh, as yes. an adolescent, Holmes uh, went to the Phillips Extra Academy before graduating high school with honors from Gilmanton Academy when he was 16. Uh, Holmes's parents were both devout Methodists. His father was from a farming family and at times would work as a farmer, a uh, trader, and house painter. He was also reportedly a heavy drinker who cruelly mistreated his family. Holmes also faced bullying by classmates due to his That's outstanding cool. academic capabilities. So a uh, smart guy we're dealing with here, I'm guessing, and was, was picked on uh, for that. Anytime you go to medical school and graduate, you're no dummy. And it's 16. I mean, I, I don't know what the, the schooling and grades and stuff were back then, but I mean, 16 at graduation, that's uh, that's fairly early. I don't know if anything was yeah. different back then. And, and I know we like to dive into psychology a little bit and something mm -hmm. I picked up on just talking. Remember, we did some of the only, and we did briefly Dahmer and we did briefly, you know, we did briefly uh, Bundy and, and all that. Uh, you know, some Hernandez, some are made uh, or some are, are, are made psychopaths, some are born psychopaths. He may have been a, a born psychopath because I know he later writes his memoirs having the devil inside him yeah. and all that. But it doesn't help either that your dad beats on you a lot. Nah. He's an alcoholic, takes his frustrations out on you. And then do you remember the incident where the school kids were bullying him and they lock him in the doctor's office and with all the skeletons inside there? And, and, yes. and he says he wasn't frightened. According to his book, yeah. this is what he writes, that he kind of liked it. He liked the book. Yeah. He said he was forced to stand in front of it and uh, put the skeleton's hands on his face to frighten mm -hmm. him. And he said initially he was scared, but then after that, he, he claimed it helped him overcome his worries. And yeah. after that, he was uh, subsequently developed an obsession with death as a result That's of that right. particular encounter that you're talking about. And, yeah. you know, later his pastime, he took up dissecting animals not long after that. So that kind of yeah. started him, I guess, down the medical path. Yeah. Um, and then he'll, then he'll definitely like stealing cadavers, right? bodies yes. <laughs> we'll get into that as well um so a little bit of background on him uh, his early life uh around 1886 he would come to chicago in the month of august uh that's when he began using uh hh Holmes or going by that name soon after his arrival he came across a drug store at a uh, northwest right. corner of south wallace avenue and west 63rd street in inglewood uh section of chicago the drugstore's owner was an Elizabeth Holton. Uh, she gave Holmes a job, and he proved to be a hardworking employee and eventually buying the store. Yeah. So, I mean, we're obviously going to get into some some pretty rough stuff that he did, but, you know, seems like a smart guy, a little bullied, hard worker, wound up buying this store. He's starting out, you know, not too terrible. And he's a doctor, too. Yeah, yeah. So, And, and he's a doctor. Do you, do, you, do you know why he came up with the name H.H. H. Holmes? I, no. I, got a, I got a theory here and I was just listening, reading, you know, that's when Sherlock Holmes came out. The character came out oh. and, and, and a lot of people thought at the same time, he picked the name Holmes. It was very popular. And of course he was doing bad things and maybe he liked, maybe deep down, he wished he was something like that. But at the end, authorities, the Pinkertons and others will put him in his place. And yes. again, it'll be his demise. And, and, and we'll talk more of his trial, but at the time in Philadelphia, that was the trial of the century. Yeah. Yeah. Very, uh, obviously, you know, covered as much as you could back in those days. Yeah. Um, contrary to several accounts, Holmes did not kill, uh, Dr. Holton Holmes purchased an empty lot across the street where construction began 
1887 for a two-story mixed-use building with yeah. apartments on the second floor and retail spaces, uh, including a new drugstore. On the first, when Holmes uh, declined to pay the architects or the steel company that worked on it, I think it was Atina Iron and Steel, yeah. they took him to court, and this would happen quite a bit. He would hire different contractors, different people to work on this mansion that he was putting together, murder house, if you will. And he would let them work for a period of time. Then he would say they're doing something wrong and basically kick them off the job and refuse to pay them. This kind of, my theory satisfied a couple things. Number one, he didn't have to pay. Them. Mm -hmm. um, number two, nobody really knew exactly the whole layout of the house because they're all working on different areas. Obviously they're not going to go back and, and rework something that's completed. So nobody really had a full grasp on what he was pulling, putting together there. That's my thoughts on any thoughts for you. No, I, I agree. Especially if, if you're having it built with trap doors, right. And you're having different chambers and you're doing all these creepy, horrible things. You want different people involved in that. But by the end too, he was a swindler too. So oh, he's yeah. a he was a doctor. He's a swindler. And later we find out he's a serial killer. And, uh, in 1982, he added a third floor telling investors, and uh, suppliers that he intended to use it as a hotel during the upcoming World's Columbian Exposition. He got a bunch of furniture donated to him, and, of course, he didn't pay these guys jack shit for it. They wound up trying to take him to court, and came, he had hid a bunch of it in some of these hidden rooms, so they didn't really get anything. Uh, contemporary accounts report that Holmes built the hotel to lure tourists visiting the exposition in order to kill them and sell their skeletons to a nearby medical school. Now, when you think about it, that could make uh, for a good movie. Uh, although he did have a history of selling stolen cadavers to medical schools, Holmes had acquired these through grave robbing rather than murder. So now you're getting into a little uh, weird territory. Yes. Likewise, there was no evidence that Holmes ever murdered exposition goers on that premises. The Yellow Press labeled the building as Holmes' murder castle, claiming the structure contained secret torture chambers, trap doors, gas chambers, a basement crematorium, and none of these sensationalized claims were true. Now, I've heard that was there, but now these things are, you know, some of the reports I read said that there wasn't. There wasn't. What have you heard about what was actually in there? I, I heard that, uh, you know, you had the ones that sensationalized, and, but once you do the, the, the more of a deep, deep dig, it shows like there really wasn't anything there after all. But it was good at the time to sell papers, right? And people oh, yeah. were really obsessed with this, and, and it helps. I, I, what I heard, he, he didn't really kill anybody there. That's but. that's that's what I kind of got to. Other accounts stated that the hotel was made up of over a hundred rooms and laid out like a maze. Hmm. Doors opening into brick walls, windowless rooms, dead end staircases, and in reality, the third floor hotel was a moderately sized, largely unremarkable, uncompleted, due that's to right. homes and disputes with the builders. That's what we were referring to earlier. Yeah. It did contain some hidden uh, hidden rooms. But that was where they put all the furniture that they gave him. So when the people come looking for it, they couldn't find it to take it back. Right. Um, Holmes did not kill an alleged castle victim, Miss Kate Durkey, who turned out to be the very much alive later on. That's when we said that he said he killed and then right. turned out to be alive. Um, in a confession that he would make later, Holmes' usual murder method was by suffocation of his victims, including an overdose of chloroform, exposure to lighting gas fumes, trapped in an airless vault to give some examples of how he would like to do things. Holmes also claimed to have used starvation and burning victims alive in his castle. I've even heard reports of like there being like an acid vat in the bottom that he would dissolve bodies and stuff like that. I mean, really wild stuff when you get into what he may or may not have had in that castle. Yeah. I, I don't know. I know. I, I'm kind of torn with that. It, it's sensationalized. It's fascinating. You know, he's a mad doctor, right? Right. Oh, oh, it's just, just these guys want to sell papers. And he was just a guy who maybe used some chloroform, killed a few people and be done with them. But still, yeah. I mean, the way he killed his partner is horrific. And we'll, yeah. we'll get into that and his family. That That's awful, allegedly, but awful. Holmes uh, hotel was gutted by fire, started by an yeah. unknown arsonist shortly after his arrest, but was largely rebuilt and used as a post office in 1938. Yeah. Besides his infamous murder castle, Holmes also owned a one-story factory, which he claimed was used for glass bending. It's unclear if the factory furnace was ever used for this purpose. 
It was speculated that it had been used to destroy incriminating evidence of Holmes crimes. Now we'll get into some of those presumed murders. This is, you know, murders that they think he might've had something to do with. There was a woman named Julia Smythe. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce her last name and her daughter, Pearl. Uh, that was Holmes's mistress. 31 year old Julia Smythe was the wife of Dr. Lawrence Iculus, Ned Connor. I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name or not. Um, who had moved into the Holmes building and began working at his pharmacy's uh, jewelry counter. After Connor found out about Smythe's affair with Holmes, he quit the job and moved away, leaving Smythe and her five-year-old daughter Pearl behind. Smythe gained custody of Pearl and remained at the hotel, continuing her relationship with Holmes. Now, her and Pearl both disappeared on Christmas Eve, 1891. Holmes initially yeah. claimed to acquaintances that Julia had left unexpectedly to visit her dying sister, but then changed his story and said that she had fled to her former husband. Ultimately, Holmes later claimed that Julia had actually died during an abortion, which I think he had told her that he wanted to do, but do it himself. Or he wanted her to do, but he wanted to perform it himself. Mm. Um, despite his medical background, Holmes was unlikely to be experienced enough to carry out his abortion. And mortally from such a procedure was high at that time. Holmes probably wound up killing her doing that. If that's indeed what happened. That's all. Yeah. Uh, then later he claimed to have poisoned Pearl likely to have the circumstances of her, uh, mother's death. That was the daughter, a partial skeleton, possibly of a child around Pearl's age was found when excavating Holmes's cellar. Pearl's father was a key witness at Holmes trial in Chicago. So that's uh, right off the bat. We're going mother, daughter, you know, miss his miss. And Melini Sagran. I'm horrible. These fucking names, man. I hope I'm <laughs> 23 year old Emelini Sagran began working in Holmes building in May of 1892 and worked for him for about six months. Uh, Holmes reportedly hired Sagran as a secretary due to her connection to a doctor who peddled a vaccine that allegedly cured alcoholism. Look at um, that. Those who saw Sagran in two weeks before her disappearance noted that she appeared to have lost interest in Holmes in their relationship. So Graham was last seen in December of 1892. Her parents were informed that she had left to marry a man named Robert Phelps. Authorities uh, figured out that she had gotten pregnant by Holmes, possibly being a victim of another failed abortion that Holmes tried to do. So he might be a good uh, surgeon, but not a good uh, abortionist here is uh, what we're learning. Um, no. he tried to cover that up as well. Her empty luggage trunk was sent back to her mother in Anderson, Indiana. Her skeleton was found by the police at the home of a sh Chicago physician with the help of MG chapel who admitted to having, uh, articulated three skeletons for HH H. Holmes. So wow. this guy's I'm getting some putting together these skeletons here. That's, that's quite interesting. Um, yep. Did you hear anything on any of these victims that we've mentioned so far? Yeah, I mean, it's the case wasn't never proved it. It's right. A lot of speculation what really happened to these to these people, but a lot of people possibly close to him could have happened like that. But uh, I didn't hear much more than that. That that uh, vaccine said allegedly cured alcoholism. I think that was actually investigated and turned out to be quite nothing but like water or something like that. Do you read anything about that? Um, that happens yeah. back then, man. They'll sell oh, yeah. snake oil to uh, cure anything, right? Yeah. Swindlers, man. Uh, yeah. Another lady, Minnie Williams. This was mm -hmm. in uh, early of 90, uh, 1893. A 24-year-old 24 24 year uh, actress, Minnie Williams, moved to Chicago. Holmes claimed to have met her in an employment office, and though it is believed that she had an, uh, actually met her, that he had actually met her in Boston several years earlier, while he was there uh, going by the alias Harry Gordon, Holmes offered her a job at the hotel as his personal stenographer, um, and she accepted it. Holmes persuaded Williams to transfer the deed to her property in Fort Works, Texas to a man named Alexander Bond, which was an alias of Holmes uh, that he would use, you know, for these types of swindles when he would swindle people. In April of uh, 1893, Williams transferred the deed with Holmes serving as the notary. Holmes mm -hmm. later signed the deed over to Peitzel, 
giving him the alias Benton T. Lyman. Now, the following month, Holmes and Williams presenting themselves as husband and wife rented an apartment in Chicago's Lincoln Park. Minnie's younger sister, 18-year-old Anna Nani Williams, came okay. to visit, and on July the 5th, 1893, she wrote to her aunt that she had planned to accompany Brother Harry to Europe. In it, she signed off with a message, Brother Harry, that would mean Holmes, uh, says, you need to never trouble any never trouble any more about me, financially or otherwise. He and sister will see to me. I hope our hard days are over. Neither Minnie nor Nanny will ever be uh, seen alive again. Holmes will subsequently use Minnie's name in future scams. So he apparently knocked her off and then would use her names to help some of these scams go out. He's already got a property from her. So right. he he was uh, a little bit ahead of the curve on some of this fraud. You know, yeah, man, that's he, really he, what he checked all the boxes from the cadavers. They say University of Michigan, right? Still stealing the dead bodies from the grave. I mean, that would come in even at, before he died. He said, please bury me under 10 uh, feet of concrete because I don't want people coming after my body. Yeah. That, that's amazing. He, he's involved in everything. He thought about even at the end, he says, you know what? I did to others. I don't want them to do it to me. What a piece of work. Um, some of the uh, suspected murders uh, that he was suspected of doing was a 16 year, uh, 68 year old creditor of Holmes named John DeBurl. I think that's how you pronounce his name. He died of a uh, apoplexy. I'm not sure how the hell you spell this word. Um, mm -hmm. On April 17th, 1891. I keep getting these dates mixed up. This was definitely 18th century uh, at the Castle Drugstore. It really collapsed and died shortly after Holmes poured a black liquid down his throat. Oh, According shit. to a witness, foul play was not suspected. I don't know how you would pick that up, but okay. Uh, in 1895, it was determined that his life had been insured and that Holmes had profited from his death. So there you go. He became his beneficiary and he killed him. So he's, he's getting money every which way he can. There'd be his forgery, um, beneficiary, killing him off. It's yeah. He's, he's really putting and, in a lot and, of work, and then he does more life insurance stuff, more life insurance scams. Yeah. Um. In 1891, Emily Van Tassel disappeared after working at a Holmes drugstore. Holmes spoke with her in his confession, or spoke of her in his confession in 1897. Tassel's name was cited in a list of suspected victim, victims, and Tassel's mother believed that she was a possible victim. Mm. Uh, Doctor Rustler, who had an office in the castle. Went missing in 1892. Holmes mentioned killing Rustler in one of his earlier confessions. A lady by the name of Kitty Kelly, a stenographer for Holmes, also went missing in 1892. Uh, John Davis of Greenville, Pennsylvania, went to visit uh, the 1893 World's Fair and vanished. In 1920, he was declared legally dead. Uh, <clears throat> it Harry seems, Walker, seems like a lot of his employees... They didn't do so well, huh? Yeah, like he's getting in there, he gets their names, gets their info, and the next thing you know, they're they're missing. They're missing. Um, yeah. They may not be killed at the murder castle, but they'll end up disappearing somewhere else. Yeah, and it seems like he's got the know-how and the means to kill them in other ways, whether it be poison or or whatever else, Um, you know, whatever he's choosing here. Harry Walker of Greenberg, Indiana, went missing in November of 1893. He was alleged to have insured his life to Holmes for $20,000 mm. and wrote to friends that he was working for Holmes in Chicago. $20,000 is a lot, a lot of money. money. Yeah. That's a lot of money. I though. mean, I don't even know what the, um, <coughs> what, what do you call that? Uh, inflation but, rate is. I think equivalent is going to be in today's, in today's standards, probably over uh, at least two or 300,000. Uh, it might even be more than that, man. It might, you yeah. might be millions. I mean, I, it, yeah, it, it's at least going to be half a million dollars. He, he's got some good buying power for sure. Yeah. Uh, Holmes and Peitzel took George Thomas out to a Mississippi swamp on the Tombagee River in mm -hmm. June of 1894. Uh, they killed him, disposed of his body. Holmes confessed to the murder uh, to his second wife. Uh, Milford Cole of Baltimore, Maryland, disappeared after receiving a telegram from Holmes to come to Chicago in 1894 an additional <laughs> possible victim was lucy burbank her bank book was found with a human hair in a chimney 
at the castle in 1985. Allegedly in his confession, Holmes claimed to have killed two persons in Lake County, Illinois, which was confirmed years later when the remains of an unknown man and unknown woman were found at a, on a farm in 1919, 23 years after his execution. Look at that. So that's some of the people that he's, you know, suspected of killing just for, you know, he basically had last communication with them. And back then a communication, I'm guessing probably had to be telegram or letter or something along that. I mean, obviously they, you know, you know, we got cell phones back in those days, but I'm yeah. sure there was probably copies of the letter. If they left them there, um, maybe their family members come to check on them, seen the letter and, you know, maybe started putting two and two together. That's how they knew this. Yeah. Maybe a witness saw them together at the end there. And then she disappears or something. Witness testimony also, perhaps. Now the murder that we said he did get convicted for Benjamin Peitzel. Yeah. Uh, we'll get into this here. This is uh this is quite interesting while working in the chemical bank building on a uh, Dearborn street. Holmes met and became close friends with 38 year old Benjamin Freeland Peitzel. Now, he was a carpenter with a criminal past who was uh, exhibiting, exhibiting in the same building a coal bin he had invented. Now, he had, this was something that he had apparently put together here. Holmes used Pizzo as his right-hand man for several criminal schemes. A district attorney later described Pizzo as Holmes' tool, his yeah. creature. Yeah. Uh, with insurance companies pressing to prosecute him for arson, Holmes left Chicago in July of 1894. He reappeared in Fort Worth, probably where he got the property from that lady. Uh, the so This one here says that he inherited it, but uh, property from the Williams sisters. That's right. But now, at the intersection of uh, modern-day Commerce Street and 2nd Street, he once again attempted to build an incomplete structure without paying his suppliers or contractors. So he's kind of mm -hmm. re- do what he did in Chicago here. Uh, July of 1894, Holmes was arrested and briefly jailed for the first time on the charge of selling mortgage goods in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, he was promptly bailed out, but while in jail, he struck up a conversation with a convicted outlaw named Marion Hedgepeth. Yeah, that's right. Who was serving a 25 year sentence. Holmes had concocted a plan to swindle an insurance company out of $10,000 by taking out a policy on himself, then faking his own death. Holmes promised Hedgepath to give a $500 commission in exchange for the name of a lawyer who could be trusted. Now, Holmes was directed to a young St. Louis attorney named Jepeth Howell. Uh, Howell thought Holmes' scheme was brilliant and agreed to play a part. Nevertheless, Holmes' plan to fake his own death failed when the insurance company became suspicious and refused to pay. Holmes did not press the claim, instead concocted a similar story with Peitzel. That's now, right. that probably wouldn't have been too bad of an idea, being that they were already on him for some of the stuff from Chicago. And as much as he's name changing, that was probably been, that was a smart move, had it have worked. Yeah, um, and it, but, and he forgot to also pay him for his contact with his attorney, the outlaw, mm -hmm. his, uh, his Sully, and that will bite him later also. All right. Uh, Peitzel agreed to fake his own death so that his wife could collect on a $10,000 life insurance policy, mm -hmm. which he was to split with Holmes uh, and how the scheme, which was to take place in a Philadelphia called for Peitzel to set himself up as an inventor under the name BF Perry and then be killed and disfigured in a lab explosion. That's what yeah. they can here. here. Um, yeah. Holmes was to find an appropriate cadaver to play the role of Peitzel. Instead, Holmes kills Peitzel on September the 4th, 1894, by knocking him unconscious with chloroform and setting his body on fire with the use of uh, benzene. And That's in his horrible. confession, yeah, in his That's... confession, Holmes implied that he was still alive. Yeah, I remember after that. he used the chloroform on him. Jesus Christ. Burn him alive. Fire. And, Burn and, him alive. And, that, and that that was his guy, man. His, his right hand man do all his schemes and he kills him at the end. Wow. Um forensic evidence uh presented at Holmes later on trial showed that the chloroform had been administrated after Pites was death. So he put that on after he died. Um a fact which the insurance companies was unaware of, presumably to stage a suicide to exonerate Holmes, should he be charged with murder. So that's actually kind of smart um yeah 
even though he figured it out. I, I see what he was doing there with his logic. Uh, yeah, that's a horrible way. To the uh, he did get pay. He did get a payout on that. Yeah, he did. Yeah, and, and then he swindled the the, the uh, Pitcher's wife too. Yeah, it was on the basis uh, of the genuine Pitcher's corpse. Holmes then went on. Holmes when the done went on to manipulate Pitcher's unsuspecting wife, as you just mentioned, Carrie Alice Canning. Yeah. Into allowing three of her five children to be placed in his custody. There's no That's fucking insane. way. That's like insane. if she knew that they were going to do this and I'm assuming she knew. Yeah. When he really wound up getting killed, you got to wonder what the heck's going on. I'm assuming, right? Yeah. Well, well she, she knows because remember the deal is that he's going to hide somewhere else and uh, she knows what's up because she's going to get a, a portion of the money. But you're gonna give him some of your children? No, that's, you can't. You can't. That. Uh, it's that lack of common sense. It's like the same thing we talked about. Albert Fish, all yeah. these families turning over their kids because he got the scheme of the daughter coming in here. Go, Who does that? Well, at least I can say at least they didn't have prior knowledge that this man was a serial killer. Like, obviously, I'm still not letting my kid go away with a stranger. Definitely different no. times back in those days. But still, we're talking about. Like a guy that she knows killed her husband, burned him alive. Yeah. Well, she well she doesn't know he, he killed them. She she suspects that it, it was someone else was killed, and they got the insurance money. And he's hiding somewhere. Okay, so she doesn't realize it is. Okay, all right. I'll see what. I'll but see what but she but she does know what kind of guy he is because he's involved in previous things. We all the stuff we talked about, right? Mm -hmm. So she knows what her husband is, and they're scheming this. So, are you still going to let? I mean. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not letting it go. Uh, the three children who were placed under Holmes' care were 13 year old Alice Peitzel, nine year old Nellie Peitzel, and seven year old Howard Robert Peitzel. <coughs> Holmes and uh, three Peitzel children traveled throughout the northeastern United States and into Canada. He simultaneously escorted Carrie along with a parallel route, all while using various aliases and lying to carry concerning her husband's death by claiming Pites was hiding in London, as well as lying to her about the true whereabouts yeah. of her three missing children. Now in Detroit, just before entering Canada, they were separated by a few blocks and an event, uh, in an even more audacious move. Holmes was staying at another location with his current wife who was unaware of the whole affair. This man's got a lot of stamina here, apparently with all these women he's seen. Yeah. Uh, Holmes confessed to murdering Alice and Nellie on October 25th, 1894, by forcing them into a large trunk, locking them inside. That's right. He drilled a hole in the lid of the trunk and put one end of a hose through the hole, attaching the other end to a gas line to asphyxiate the girls. Holmes buried their nude bodies in the cellar of a rental house at 16... Vincent Street in Toronto. Holy that's awful. shit. That's awful, huh? Awful. Awful. What, what he does is to, was, was two girls, what, what he did to their father, and what he what he'll do to his son. Yeah. Um, Frank Geyer, a Philadelphia Police Department detective, uh, was assigned to investigate homes and find the three missing children. In June of 1985, Geyer began tracing homes steps and found the decomposed body of the two pites of girls in the cellar of the Toronto home. He wrote the deeper we dug, the more horrible the odor became. And when we reached the depth of three feet, we discovered what appeared to be the bone of the forearm of a human being. Uh, in Toronto guy discovered unsent letters written to the pites of children that Holmes had kept. So they were, I guess, writing their dad maybe. Um, and he kept them. Uh, this information led to further uh, investigations of Holmes' Chicago property and ultimately led Guyer to Indianapolis where Holmes had rented a home in the Irvington neighborhood. Holmes was reported to have visited a local pharmacy to purchase drugs, which he had used to kill Howard Peitzel on October the 10th, 1894. Mm. Uh, a repair shop to sharpen knives he used to chop up the body before he burned it. The boy's teeth and bones were discovered in the home's chimney. That's awful. wow. Yeah, that's awful. Awful. This uh, this guy's a piece of work. Um, 
That's why I, I just feel bad for him when, when it took 18 minutes and he was strangling. His neck didn't snap when, when so it's like you know he did some really bad things, just like Albert Fish and all these guys. You know, he, he's another one that suffered a lot when he was executed. Oh well. I mean, that's that's a lot of bad. I mean, <laughs> I'm not condoning any of this in any way, but when you start doing these kind of things to children, like I've just got no remorse for however you go, however long it takes, or however slow the process. Mm -mm. I mean, children just are. They're very innocent and all this. I mean, I'm sure a lot of these other people that he killed, older, you know, people were too, but there's just something different about when you're inflicting pain on a child. I mean, it's just, that's another level of inhumane. Yeah, Pitesol did to himself when, when he started dealing with this guy. Yeah. He, he was involved with shit and he knows what's going to end up. When, when you deal with someone like this, you know what's going to end up. He's going to turn on you one day. It's like a bad dog. One day it's going to bite you one day. Yep. And he did. Yep. Um, we'll get into a little bit on the capture here. Holmes' murder spree finally ended when he was arrested in Boston on November 17, 1894, after being tracked there from the Philadelphia by private Pinkerton National Detective Agency. That's right. He was held on an outstanding warrant for horse theft in Texas because authorities had become more suspicious at this point that Holmes had appeared poised to flee the country in the company of his unsuspecting third wife. Mm. You know anything about this horse theft? Mm -mm. Not, not much other than that's where the that's where the Pinkerton got him. I'm not sure if he went back or not, or he stayed there. And I think they started the uh, the uh, the case against him for the murder of uh, Peitzel. Yeah, in July of 1895, following the discovery of Alice and uh, Nellie's bodies, Chicago police and reporters began investigating Holmes' building in Inglewood, now yeah. locally referred to as Castle. Now, though many sensationalized claims are made, as we mentioned earlier, no evidence was found which could have convicted Holmes in Chicago. As we said, it did catch fire um, and was gutted. There was only very circumstantial physical evidence of the cast of uh, victims. A piece of human bone, possibly from Julia Connor, the lady we talked to earlier, or talked about earlier, uh, who had the child Pearl, a burned gold watch chain, and a burn dress button apparently belonging to Minnie, who was another one of the victims we mentioned, and a tuft of human female hair found in the drain. Thus, Holmes will be tried for the murder of Peitzel in Philadelphia, which he had the clearest case for murder. So yes. circumstantial, I guess, would be the word you're looking for and all that other stuff, but Peitzel, yeah. they seem to have dead to rights. Um, in October of 1895, Holmes was put on trial for the murder of Benjamin Peitzel was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to death. By then it was evidence home that also murdered the three missing Peitzel children. Following his conviction, Holmes confessed to 27 murders in Chicago, Indianapolis and Toronto and six attempted murders. Holmes was paid $7,500 by the Hearst newspaper in exchange yeah. for his confession. So, so, so they're he, paying he, he got paid he, back then. He, he got paid money to pretty much sensationalize so they can sell more papers. Right. And if you think, again, these are some big dollar amounts back then, bro. I mean, like, this is $1895. $7,500 today is a pretty crazy. decent chunk of money. I mean, they can buy you a nice used car. $1895, that's what he got. Now, granted, he was in jail. I don't know what the hell he's going to do with it. but Yeah, that's that's a good point. What, he, what did he do with that money? Well, he couldn't do much. And where'd it go? Yeah. That's, that's interesting enough, too. That's, I, don't know, somebody, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't know what happened with that money, but I don't know. <laughs> I mean, somebody uh, went somebody's pocket, I'm sure, somewhere up the line. Yeah. Uh, while writing his confessions in prison, Holm mentioned how he drastically, uh, his facial appearance had changed since his imprisonment. On May 7th, 1896, Holm was hung at the Mayo, M Mayo Menzing Prison. For the mm -hmm. murder of uh, Peitzel, until the moment of his death, Holmes remained calm and, you know, showing very few signs of fear, anxiety, or depression. Despite this, he asked for his coffin to be contained, like you said earlier, in ten. concrete and buried 10 feet beneath the surface because he was concerned grave robbers would steal his body like he was doing earlier. Like in he the did. Summer. I had no, I no problem with that either. That's what he did. He, he and used it for dissection. Um, That's what he should happen uh, to him. Yeah, exactly. I don't know what he's going all crazy for here. Uh, like you said, his uh, neck did not break. Instead, he strangled to death slowly, twitching Horrible. for roughly 18 minutes. Um, you know, I'm not too upset about that. 
No, not at all. No, and not what he did to, what he did to that, those poor girls and that boy, and, and and that's just awful, awful. And he and I forget he also wrote, wrote a memoir before he was executed too. Not yes. only did that, and, and he he referred to himself as the devil inside. That he, he had issues and he was always obsessed and he talks about some things about that. So I wrote I read a little bit about it. Interesting read to read that the, the mind what he was thinking. But he's all trying to you know diss himself from some of these murders at that one. Then he would change it later when he got paid. Right? He changes. So you read that his memoir and you read his confession. Complete different stories. Now you mentioned earlier there was a connection with the guy that he was uh, first starting these uh, insurance scams with or, or faking their own death did he have a connection with how he got caught what was that i thought you said something about that would come back to bite him when he didn't pay him his 500 oh the, the outlaw guy that was in yeah. jail with him in, in st louis yeah he, he gets upset too and i think he's the one also that helps uh uh get tip information to the authorities about what he was saying about his insurance scams okay he cooperates and then he helps him out but you know what happens, man? He paid you out. He hooked you up with your a contact for your attorney, like he promises, and he forgot to pay him back. That didn't sit well with him. No, he didn't forget. He just didn't want to. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> uh, upon his execution, Holmes' body was uh, put in an unmarked grave at the Holy Cross Cemetery, Catholic Cemetery in Philadelphia, western suburb of Eden, Pennsylvania. Um, yeah. I, on New Year's Eve, nineteen oh nine. I saw a YouTuber go out there and he found it. He has a video about it. So he focused on it, right? He has a little show and uh, he talks about it. And the t tombstone has been vandalized. Oh, and it's imagine. kind of, it's broken in half and all that. So, and then he talks about H.H. Holmes there, unmarked, but everybody knows it's there because, you know, it's been his historical. It, actually, they had resumed the body because allegedly they said he escaped because of the money he made and that it, he wasn't executed. And allegedly family members said later that possibly could have been. So they went in and they found him and uh, they found his dental records that it was him. Yeah, I did remember uh, reading that. Um, actually, I do have the notes here on that guy, Hedgepath, who had been pardoned for informing on Holmes. He was actually shot and killed. That's the guy we were mentioning earlier, the outlaw. He was oh, shot okay. and killed by the police officer, Edward Jaburik, during a holdup at a Chicago bar. On Look March 7th, 1914, the Chicago oh. Tribune reported the death of Patrick Quinlan, the former caretaker of the castle. So all those people wind up dying here. The mysterious uh, mysteries of Holmes Castle would remain unexplained. Quinlan had committed suicide by taking strychnine. So, you know, who knows what he might have been living with on his conscience. Um, his body was found in his bedroom with a note that read, I couldn't sleep. Oh, well. Wow. Quinlan's surviving relatives claimed that he had been haunted for several months and was suffering from hallucinations. So who knows what he might have, you know, seen in there being the caretaker of uh, that, you know, murder castle, if you will, alleged murder castle. Alleged murder castle and what else he might have found in there. Hmm. Yeah. Um, the castle itself was damaged by a fire, like we said, in uh, August of 1985. Two men were seen entering the back of the building between 9 p.m. About a half hour later, they were seen exiting the building, rapidly running away. Following several explosions, the castle went up in flames. Afterwards, investigators found a half-empty gas can underneath the back steps of the building. Uh, the building survived the fire and remained in use until it was torn down in 1938. The site is currently occupied by the Inglewood branch of the United States Postal Service. Um, right. I still wouldn't go to the mail a damn letter. That's just too little, little too freaky. Little creepy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, be, I'll be, I'll be using UPS or something like that, or, or mm -hmm. uh, you're just going to the uh, post office, right? <laughs> yeah. Chicago's a big city. In 2017, during allegations, Holmes had escaped his execution. That's kind of referring to what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Holmes' body was exhumed. Testing led by Janet uh, Minogue of the University of Pennsylvania of Archaeology. And anthropology due to his coffin being contained in concrete his body was found not to have decomposed normally his clothes were almost perfectly preserved what his mustache was found to be intact that's a little weird the body was positively identified by his teeth uh that of being Holmes, and he was then reburied now as a conspiracy that's floated around for a while that he was possibly jack the ripper oh yeah yeah 
Um, one of the guys that really jumped into this uh, conspiracy was a guy by the name of Jeff Mudgett. You know who that is? That's, that's his great-great-grandson, right? It is. He learned at a family dinner his great-great-grandfather was H.H. H. Holmes, the infamous con man and serial killer who operated a so-called murder castle during the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Can you imagine at a family dinner? I mean, I don't know if it's Thanksgiving or Sunday dinner or whatever, and you find out that your great-great-grandfather is one of the more notable serial killers of all times. Like, how the hell do you finish off that dinner? No, man. Um, not only that, America's alleged first serial killer, right? America's you, first serial killer and had the trial of the century. They're you got to break out century. whiskey at that point. There's no way you don't yeah, start. Yeah, you're like, and then he embraces it and then he does some digging and he comes up with this interesting theory. Yeah. So Mudgett found himself diving deep into the evil and stress ancestry, if you will, and yeah. researching the murderer whose real name was Herman Webster Mudgett. When I learned these terrible origins, I have, he said, I was quite passionate to determine how much of the H.H. H. Holmes story was true and how much was legend and lore. A Las Vegas resident said, or uh, his, the Las Vegas resident said, and that passion became an obsession. His obsession eventually hmm. led to yet another startling discovery as handwriting analysis that Mudgett said proves Holmes and Jack the Ripper were actually the same person. He explored that evidence in his 2011 book, Bloodstains, yeah. and a 2017 History Channel documentary series called American Ripper. The correlation of the handwriting was made, and based on some handwriting comparisons that they had with the famous Dear Boss letter allegedly sent by Jack the Ripper to London's Central News Agency in 1888, um, it was a match. And allegedly, Holmes visited London around that time. Now, what do you know and what do you make of the conspiracy theory that he was H.H. H. Holmes? I mean, it's exciting. It's sensational, it's sensational, isn't it? I mean, just think about that. Could could he have pulled that off? Could he? I mean, he was a doctor, right? A surgeon. He, he could have been. But it seems like, you know, look at how he killed people with chloroform, right? Jack, there was totally a slasher. Very, yes. He's a slasher. He goes in there, prostitutes. This guy's not killing prostitutes, right? right. This guy has girlfriends. He doesn't yeah. have a problem getting a girlfriend. This guy, this guy, Dr. Ripper, has some issues there with women. And he, he he's attacking the prostitutes that he loathes in London, in, in a portion of London there. And uh, um, and, and also there was this guy, I can't remember the author's name now, who wrote The uh, the Devil in the White City. Um, yes. I don't have his name off, off top here, but he kind of shows, and he did his research, that it's pretty much impossible that because of all the court dates, he's remember he's a swindler. He's being sued a lot. He's in and out of court in 1888. Yeah. It possible for him to be in London doing these things while it shows that he's in Chicago, or at least he also visited family in New Hampshire. So yes. it appears that he's in the U.S. and almost impossible to be in being in London this time. But it's fascinating to compare the two. That's for sure. Well, the, to me, that's you, you bring an interesting point there. The styles of murders are different. The way yeah. the murders are carried out is different. The victims are different. Like you said, in the, in the Jack the Ripper, he's killing prostitutes. They are surgically removing organs. I mean, this is a very precise uh, killer in Jack the Ripper. Um, he was writing letters, you know, like we said, uh, to the Central News Agency. Now, Holmes never really done that in the no. States. I mean, these murders, like you said, were chloroform, burning bodies, you know, basically totally suffocating, asphyxiation, um, totally different, no, never any. No, nothing outside like that. Nothing in public yeah. like that. Yeah, Being nothing enclosed. of, you know, allegedly that we know of, you know, nothing of slicing them open and removing no. organs. So I think it's two very different people. And, you know, one thing that I've learned when I've researched all these things is nobody wants to let the general public think we don't know who somebody was, right? You know, so the Zodiac, they've tried to nail down who that was. Off topic, not a serial killer, but D.B. Cooper, they've tried to give his identity. I don't think they wanted to let Jack the Ripper 
be an unknown guy. So I think they've just been like, this guy here was so bad. We'll just say that was him because people will believe it. And, you know, it lets us say, Hey, we know who it was, but obviously he's dead now. You know, there's nothing we could do. I think that's a way of kind of covering that. They really just didn't have a clue who this Jack the Ripper was. Jack the Ripper, no, no, not, not at all. And I think every year, every two years, there's always a new theory who Jack the Ripper is, right? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I always see one that comes out. No, I think it's this guy for this reason. And, and it's, 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 it's fascinating to do it. And, and uh, allegedly, there's uncanny resemblance between them also. Really? That's yeah, that's what they also say also that they, they look identical with the mustache. But, but you know what? But, but the whole look, I mean, the average person then was a lot smaller, stocky like that. They always had those big so it's like, come on, man. And he's also yeah. English, right? His family is English, right? They came over. So I don't know. Maybe, like, maybe uh, enough uh, evidence there they can try to paint it, but I'm just not buying that. Um the de the book you mentioned earlier, Devil in the White City. Now this thing has been rumored to be a movie. Um, last I heard, it's being turned into a Hulu Netflix series. At one point in time, Leonardo DiCaprio oh, nice. was attached to play Holmes. Whether or not this is still a go, still in production, I couldn't find anything on it like concrete. But what a series that would be! Um, when you run into these time pieces, if you will, they can get quite pricey to put together correctly. Um, Boardwalk Empire. If anybody ever watched that, the HBO Watch series yeah. about the bootlegging and stuff, that was a very expensive show to shoot because of how, you know, they needed to set everything in those times. So you've got to get clothes made from those days. You've yeah. got to get cars, right. vehicles, um, you know, furniture, you know, you're going to have to spend some serious money to pull this off visually um right. now granted hulu's got the money to do it i mean you know i wouldn't go so far as to call them you know and say they have netflix bank account but mm -hmm. there's there's probably pretty sizable but that would be the only thing that uh i don't know if they would do it in a continued series like season one season two they might have to do it in a mini series and call it done um because mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons why they had to stop boardwalk empire outside the fact that everybody was gaining popularity and they had big salaries um, it was just a very expensive, you know, project to shoot because you got to keep with the times. So that'd be interesting, man. I think that would be good. I think Leonardo playing that character, he could I mean, fit that bill quite well. I think he could, he could fit him smaller stature guy, obviously very well accomplished actor. I think it would be something a little out of the box. It for would him. be for him. Yeah. Yeah. To, to play a serial killer, man, that, that's kind of a risque world for him because then he's getting demonized like that too. So some actors don't like to go that far out there because that's, that's a nasty, as we, as we said, that guy's nasty child mm -hmm. killer, family killer, people killer that that guy showed no remorse. He, he had no soul. Like he said, he had the devil inside him, the devil inside mm -hmm. him in the white city. And that was like, there's a lot of, stories about actors that turned down roles in movies that were dark. Um, yeah, I was watching true. the movie seven with my son recently. Yeah. He had never seen it. And okay. I was reading nowadays, like when I read move or watch movies, I automatically go to the IMDB and start reading like trivia on the movies. And it said that that role of Brad Pitt mm -hmm. was offered to Denzel Washington. And mm -hmm. he turned it down because he felt the movie was too dark. And that would have been a, not that Brad Pitt didn't do amazing. But that would have been a good role with Freeman and Washington bouncing off each other. But then a couple of years later, Washington does a similar movie, not necessarily quite around the seven deadly sins, but he does a movie called fallen, which was pretty dark where he was hunting this serial killer and he was able to transfer through people by touch. And the only way he knew who it was, where they would sing this song repetitively time is on my side. So every mm -hmm. time he would touch somebody and the spirit would jump, you would hear them singing that song time oh, okay. it, was, it was quite creepy um so it, it was interesting I, that he passed on that and then well, jumped he, played a, he played a pretty bad bad guy killer in training day oh yeah yeah that was he won an oscar for Gang, that. gangster so yeah at the end he, had, he, he went he went dark he played gangster cop pretty much yeah so lapd pro probably up feeding off at the same time of uh rampart and all that stuff yeah. the scandals are breaking off there with lapd so Interesting there, but you know what? It's easier for them to film those movies in LA, right? Yeah, and do a tie piece. <laughs> yeah. A lot, a lot easier out there. Um, yes. 
Uh, that, that that about does it, man. You got anything to add on this guy? Like I said, I didn't want to do too much of a a deep deep dive, like what we have with some of our other shows. We're gonna wrap this up in about an hour because there's just not a lot that I can say was 100 percent factual. So I didn't want to give no, a whole bunch of information on stuff that we really can't validate. You know, no, everything from you know Jack the Ripper, the murder castle, everything. I think we do know he was executed. It appears he, he was convicted killing a, a guy that he worked a lot with doing all the dirty deeds. And, and I hate to say that his wife, P Pitzel's wife, made a horrific decision giving his two beautiful daughters and son and um, died. I did see a show, a documentary, where Pitzel's uh, um, grandchildren talked about it, which I, I found it fascinating. They traced back the steps and all that. And um, it, was, it was touching to hear them talk about it. But at the same time, you know, the family member also allegedly wasn't a very good guy either. Yeah. He, he, he was involved in a lot of stuff. So, you know what? That's what happens when you hang out and you do stuff with, with the devil. The devil ends up getting you. Yeah. Well, that'll do it for today's episode of HH Holmes. I'm, I'm really enjoying these behind the serial killers, man. No, they're good, man. We'll get some good ones coming. And, 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 and please enjoy it. And you like this, uh, Psycho Killers. It's a book that I wrote about it. I wrote all, all these ones we've talked about, has been on all the books that the books I have. And uh, maybe we'll do also one on infamous LA murders. And we'll talk about maybe the Black Dahlia or uh, we talk about the uh, the Wonderland gang, right? Yes. I think I yeah. told you to go check out that movie, The Wonderland Murders. Great yeah. film, great story. Documentary, too. A lot of, uh, lot of pieces to that story. It's a, it's a lot of players. You got Holmes himself, Eddie Nash, Eddie um, Nash. The Wonderland what, gang. I what, mean, what a, what a character that guy was. Yeah, you could do a whole show on Eddie by himself. Yes. I mean, he, was, he was a character for sure. Yes, 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 yes. And, and, and also, and L.A. had so many infamous murders there. And we just mentioned, mentioned a few there. But uh, also. Man, uh, Manson murders. Uh, Manson uh, cult. Bobby cult. And he, his cult was, was serial killers. Yeah. The serial killers. So that could be one behind, you know, we can do one like that too. All right, my friend, well, that'll do it for H.H. Holmes. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Keep tuning in. They'll keep pumping them out behind the serial killers here on Crime and Entertainment. Ignacio, thank you All for right, stopping guys. by, my friend. Always, Gosh. brother. All right, man. All right, guys. Ciao.